and uh, now to uh, infuse you on the many exciting developments that await us in the year ahead, we're going to show you a very short video. Great. Great, so that, so that, um, um, that, sequence, that sequence of events, of events uh, uh, was accompanied by um, the aria Jamai del Forte uh, from Act One of Donizetti's L'Assedio di Calais, the role of Aurelio being sung by one of this country's most accomplished uh, singers on the opera stage, Della Jones. And I'm delighted that Della is uh, kindly agreed uh, to join us this evening. Uh, more on that and uh, La Sedio di Calais uh, in a minute. Um, of course, in my introductory remarks, I managed to forget the important uh, parish notices of which uh, you'll all be familiar with by now. There, there are really only two. Uh, the first is to say, um, uh, uh, please uh, put yourselves on mute, um, uh, although there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of this presentation when obviously you'll need to unmute uh, yourselves. And also to say that we are recording this session. So for if for any reason you don't wish your uh, image to appear on camera, then you can of course choose to switch your camera off. Um, so um, without further ado, um, let me introduce uh, three very special guests. Our artistic director, Carlo Rizzi, um, our artistic dramaturg and very much the guiding force between our operatic rediscoveries, Roger Parker, and of course, as I said earlier, Della Jones. So uh, over to you and over to you, Roger. Yeah, well, um, I wanted to talk first of all about this plan that we've had to um, <clears throat> to um, uh, publish a, a box set of three Donizetti operas, uh, which had been released some many years before now, but are now out of, out of print. And so we thought we'd collect them together in a box and, uh, and offer these again. Um, they're all from the 1830s and they're all by Donizetti. And we chose these, these three because they sum up very different aspects of this composer. I mean, he was such a, a sort of versatile composer. And the first one is, 
Il Diluvio Universale, which is from 1830, and it's a very experimental work. It's a, a story of Noah and the Ark, um, but it's almost an oratorio. It's very, very um, unusual experimental work. Somewhat in, in its experimental nature, it's rather like Il Paria, which we, we did recently from that period. Then the, the next one is Ugo Conte, Conte di Parigi, from 1832, which is a classic melodrama in the style of Lucia di Lammermoor, is the kind of bread and butter, if you want, of, of Donizetti and style. And then the third one, which you heard a, a brief clip from just then, was La Sedio di Calais, The Siege of Calais, um, 1836, which is very much Donizetti looking towards France and experimenting with new ideas of making music drama. So in a sense, in these three operas, you've got a kind of conspectus of three very different, um, very different Donizetti's. So we thought it'd be interesting to collect those together. And the, the last two of these, Ugo Conte di Parigi and La Serie di Calais, uh, have as one of their star singers, Della Jones. So it's great that she can be here. And I was wondering, Della, if I could ask you, I mean, one of the, the obviously these, these operas were, <clears throat> were unknown at the time, but I think even more surprising that the very style of these operas was unknown. I mean, this, this kind of uh, florid uh, romantic melodrama simply wasn't part of the repertory when these operas were first performed. So, I mean, my question to you, first question to you is, how did you, how did you learn this style? How did you learn to inhabit this style in such a seamless way? Have I on, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, fine. Well, I had already been singing a lot of coloratura work uh, at ENO, but then I met Patrick Schmidt, and introduced me to Don and Seti. Um, I always, from a young age, had the facility of singing coloratura, but introduced into this fantastic unknown repertoire of music, it was a natural transition for me. Uh, it was, I worked, I had the system, I still teach, coach people the system of working of breaking down coloratura into phrases into sentences into groups of music um but i i did have a natural facility for it but you never stop working on it ever ever and it was glorious music yeah. glorious yeah. The, the actually also the drama of it and working with Patrick and the team. Yeah, I just, I mean, Patrick, I mean, when you look at the, the, the sort of lineup of singers that he managed to get for these, for these operas, like with Ugo Conte di Parigi, it's an incredible group of singers. I mean, how, was, how did he lure people into this project? You know, I mean, what happened? Well, I went, I'd heard about Operara and somebody said to me, you want to go and audition for Patrick Smith? And I went. And he said, I saw you in Cenerentola at the Coliseum. And he said, oh, let's go through something. And he said, yes, darling, I, I won't do his accent. It was so superb. And he said, yeah, well, we'll be looking at a lot of things together. And I, I would like Opera Rara one day to tell me how many recordings I have done, because there were a lot, a lot. Yeah. And I tell you the greatest thing about it all was the camaraderie and the genuine, genuine music making of all the singers wanting to get it together and work. There were no divas, there was no aggro. It was, we were a team and we wanted it to work. And that's what music making is all about. And it gave me a huge, step up in my career. Yes, I was already performing, I'd done a few little recordings, but Operara was my launch into the, in, in, into a big career. Yeah, and so you, you found that the experience of, of, particularly of doing Ugo in the, in the late 1970s changed the way your career developed after that. Um, excuse me, Roger, I wasn't born yeah. then. <laughs> oh, sorry, I made a, a dreadful mistake. Uh, just <laughs> Just yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah. 
I was in my mother's womb. Uh, no, it, it, it was incredibly exciting. It was an, uh, the, yeah, it was so vibrant, that first recording for Opera Rara. Yeah, and was it was it done under a great deal of time pressure, or did you? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, I can remember. I, I've already maybe Opera Rara listeners will will have heard this before when I had an interview with Carlo, but I can remember at Henry Ward Hall about quarter to ten of an evening, and Patrick came through on the little telephone and said, "Della, darling," he said, "We have." Under 15 minutes to do this, your last aria. And he said, we have no money for any overtime for the orchestra. So you have to get it in one take. And that is God's truth. It was one take. And do you know what? I quite like that. Because it meant you just did it as if you were on stage. Yeah, so yeah. there was no time for mistakes. He said any mistakes will be in. Um, and you can tell some of that excitement, I think, you know, that, I mean, that produces drama, doesn't it? That, that kind well, of thing. It does. You know. And it also, it also gives an inner peace in a way, because you know, it's like being on a stage. Yeah. There is no, excuse me, can I do that again? Can I sing that No. Can I edit? Ha! Edits? What were edits then, you know? Look, I mean, we could talk all evening uh, and uh, it would be fascinating. I, I, the time is against us. I'm going to have to pass over to Carlo now. Uh, but I have to tell you one thing. Yes. I have to mm. tell you the last thing. I named, at the time, I had two Siamese cats and one was called Ugo Conte di Parigi. <laughs> and the other and, Lucia di Lamamore or what? Uh, no, the other one was a legal thing, another story. But at 12 o'clock at night, I'd be calling them in, Ugo Conte di Parigi! The neighbours <laughs> thought, what is she doing? Sorry, I will stop. Wonderful. Thank you. Pleasure. Carlo. Hello. <clears throat> nice to see all of you. Welcome for the announcement of the season. That is a particular season. Is a uh, personally... A great thing to be able to announce something after all this uh, disaster of COVID and um, to know that we can come back slowly to work. I've just uh, come back today from a rehearsal at the Welsh National Opera. I, I was working with a student of the College of Cardiff and um, on one side it was a sort of uh, strange experience because imagine uh, you know, the stage of the WNC, the Welsh Millennium Centre, that is quite big, um, was uh, uh, basically all the orchestra players were dotted around the stage. Orchestra players, the general would fit in an orchestra pit, all because of the distancing, etc. But at least uh, we were doing something. And this is, uh, <clears throat> you know, the right way forward. Uh, and I just wanted to say a small thing before to go back to the season, um, that in all this, uh, uh, in the pieces of work that I've been lucky to be able to do this year, uh, one thing has come out, and uh, not only here in the UK or nor in Italy, but uh, everywhere I've worked, uh, also in Germany, in Spain, one thing has come out, that is uh, that uh, live performances uh, cannot be substituted uh, by anything else. And uh, in a way, uh, you know, it was necessary something like this because, you know, before, um, I don't know if you've heard, but people were talking about, oh, well, you know, maybe we can do something online or this or that, but no, the, the feeling of being uh, in a live performance as is, uh, you know, a live uh, sport event uh, and a rock concert, cannot uh, uh, be substituted by something through the internet. Uh, uh, the public is important, you are important. Uh, and uh, so it's great now that uh, we can announce this season and particularly the live performance uh, that we 
we'll do a Cadogan Hall on the 3rd of December this year, 2021, uh, where we per, uh, will perform uh, after the recording that we have done in the, in the days before, uh, uh, Leon Cavallo's Zingari. And uh, the cast uh, um, is a great, great, great cast uh, because uh, we have uh, um, Krasimira Stoyanova that uh, will sing the role of uh, Fleana. Uh, we will have the tenor Arsen Sogomonian uh, that will sing uh, the part of uh, Radu. And then, uh, um, well, Carlos Alvarez, famous baritone, that um, uh, will sing the part of the baritone Tamar. And, uh, well, you will hear him also a few days, a few months before, because he's opening the Royal, uh, the Royal Opera House. And there is also Lucas Golinski that uh, will make uh, her uh, opera uh, debut. The orchestra will be the Royal Philharmonic. And uh, I'm really very interested uh, in, uh, in this opera because, uh, I mean, Idel will, uh, <clears throat> will let Dietle to speak more about uh, the story of the opera. But one piece of information is that uh, after Pagliacci, Zingari still, uh, up to today date, uh, the most performed opera of uh, Leon Cavallo. And I, I am always very, been very intrigued by Leon Cavallo because in a way he's a very multifaceted composer. Uh, in, uh, in some ways very refined. And then sometimes you find some incredibly um, naive way of writing for the voices, uh, for the orchestra. And I think that, uh, you know, this going from one point to the other uh, is what makes uh, his, life, his music uh, very alive uh, and very, very, very um, touching, uh, not, not in a nice way, but also can be quite very impactful. Um, the last thing that I wanted to say is that uh, although the, uh, the story of Zingari is uh, more or less uh, the same uh, the same story of uh, Pagliacci and also technically the way that Leon Cavallo writes the opera you know with the opening chorus uh, the three singer soprano baritone and tenor this opera for me is even more interesting particularly in the role of the of Fleana that is the the, the soprano that uh, I defined her uh, a sort of uh, verismo Carmen. It's a very fiery woman. She passed from one lover to the others uh, unashamedly. And uh, is, uh, I would say, a very, very modern woman that she knows what, uh, what she wants and she gets, uh, apart from the fact that then she gets killed at the end, but that is uh, another story. And um, it's very interesting for me that, uh, you know, after the three sets of Donizetti that... Uh, Della Roger were talking about. Uh, this shows also the versatility of Opera Rara because we are going to explore a completely different uh, uh, moment, uh, Verismo, uh, and we will do, you know, other things in the in the in the year to come. So, so yeah, um, I hope that you will be there with us. And I actually would like now to introduce Dietlev, Dietlev Rindom, so that he can tell you a little bit uh, more of information about uh, the opera. Thanks, Carlo. Um, I agree. I mean, it's hugely exciting that this performance and recording can take place in December. Um, and actually, there's something really quite fitting about the fact that this will be Opera Rara's return to live performance, because Zingari was actually um, first performed in London, um, which may come as a surprise to some of you. Um, and I agree with Carlo. I mean, this is a really interesting piece. Um, and in lots of ways, it is the most, the opera by Len Cavallo that is most similar to Pagliacci um, in certain respects. Um, but it does come at this really interesting moment in Leon Cavallo's career, so that early on, um, right at the beginnings of his career, he was very interested in writing these big historical epics. He was fascinated by Wagner, and Pagliacci was actually a bit of a sidestep away from that for him in 1892. And in the years that came afterwards, he sort of moved between these two spheres of writing these more kind of modern, urbane pieces, and then wanting to write these big historical epics. But by the early 20th century, he'd also started to experiment with writing operettas, um, and he was open to new propositions generally, professionally. And so in 1911, he actually came to London to do a whole series of performances of Pagliacci at the Hippodrome Theatre in Leicester Square, which is a kind of venue that put on a whole series of different genres. And this was a really big success for him, although it was actually done in an abbreviated form, if you can imagine, Pagliacci is not long, but um, it was already too, too long for the Hippodrome. 
um, and he was then invited back to, to uh, premiere a new opera just for London at the Hippodrome. And so he came up with this idea of Zingiri, which is very similar in form to Pagliacci. It's just an hour long, really two episodes separated by an intermezzo and, and with a similar sort of plot set up um, with the love triangle between the tenor and the baritone and the soprano. Um, but I think what's really interesting about this piece in particular is, I mean, it's based on a Pushkin poem, The Gypsies, um, which is also the basis for a very early opera by uh, Ramanov. Um, but so the sort of the really new interesting element here, I think, is that um, Leon Cavallo really wanted to explore what he could do with this gypsy theme. So you find an awful lot of um, interesting ornamentation in the vocal lines, really rich percussion section with an anvil chorus, um, all sorts of syncopated dance rhythms, wordless writing, for this kind of Carmen-esque heroine that Carlo described. Um, so there's a really sort of distinctive, fresh quality to Len Cavallo's writing here. And so I completely agree with Carlo too that what's so exciting about Len Cavallo as a composer is that he's always doing something different. He's doing something different within the operas, but also across the pieces too. Um, so I think this will be a great way for opera to sort of make its return to the stage. And I think um, it will be a huge treat. It's not long, absolutely action packed. It's got enough events for a three hour opera, not just one, I'd say. And um, back to Carlo. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes, I can hear my dulcet tone through the microphone of somebody else. Okay, no, good, better now. Um, yeah, so now I would like to speak about uh, the other big event of the season that is uh, an opera of Mercadante, Il Proscritto, that I can safely say that nobody has heard before, they're still alive at least, is, uh, is an opera that, um, that we have discovered, um, you know, because what, uh, uh, you know, what I'm doing and uh, obviously also what Roger <coughs> and Hitler do, uh, we have to go through manuscripts, and uh, part of our uh, uh, job, a big part, an important part, is actually to then make uh, a judgment uh, about uh, uh, a manuscript that we see and to try to understand uh, if uh, the opera has not survived because it's bad, or if the opera has not survived because of circumstances. You know, it happens all the time. Just think. Um, for example, when I was, uh, um, you know, a student at La Scala in the, uh, sorry, not La Scala, in Milan, and I was a student in the 70s, uh, that was the beginning of the uh, Rossini Renaissance. Uh, you know, Bado brought to La Scala uh, some Rossini opera that were not uh, been heard before. And uh, look now, <laughs> Rossini is known for all his operas, of course, some more than others. So it's, uh, it's important always to go to check and to see. And for me, as a musician, what is important is uh, the feeling that the music gives me. And when I came across the, the score of the proscritto, I, the autograph of the proscritto, I really immediately have been captivated by the music, by the opening scene. It's a huge opening scene that actually requires a, a lot uh, of, uh, is, a, is an option, is a, is a marriage, you know, and uh, requires a lot of uh, brass, uh, trumpet, actually, probably this is not the right moment to break the news to our CEO and Little that there will be a lot of uh, extra players involved in the I've first scene. Seen. I've seen ah, yeah. ah, okay. <laughs> anyway, and uh, um, it's a really wow. It's a, it's a really big opening. And then the melody, the story developed, and this very, very, very nice music and very interesting music. You know, Mercadante was also a professor. I think I think it was teaching uh, probably Roger will correct me here. Um, I don't know harmonia contrapunto solfeggio something in Napoli, mm -hmm. and so there is also a part of his composition that is uh, a little bit intellectual, and, uh, and I think that in a way makes it more close to our modern feeling, you know, when there are certain unexpected turns uh, of harmony or uh, unexpected uh, uh, way of um, or orchestration. 
and uh, and in fact, actually, there is one point uh, that I'm still uh, trying to understand uh, if uh, is a very very daring uh, um, harmonic uh, um, uh, moment, uh, or if it's a mistake. <laughs> this, I don't know. We will uh, we will decide before to to perform. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, this is. Uh, um, you know, something that I'm really, really very interested in. And one thing that I think is very important for our uh, friends, uh, our donors, is that uh, what we want to do is to take you, um, you know, hand, in hand uh, with us uh, in the, in uh, discovery, this, uh, this, uh, this new score from, from the beginning, uh, through every stage uh, that uh, we will have to go through to arrive from the manuscript uh, to the live performance. Um, so now to Roger um, to yeah, say something I mean, about the opera. One of the things that um, you know we've been involved in about the, the last six months is just converting this manuscript uh, into a printed score, which we've just finished. And I see that Ian Schofield uh, is, is on this call. Um, and he was the man who did the heroic task of deciphering this, this hugely complicated manuscript and making it into, into a modern orchestral score, which is really one of the, is one of the unsung heroes of this, of this operation. But um, we have a little video um, of, uh, uh, of some snatches from, uh, from this opera. So you, this is this first public performance that you'll hear. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so you heard the, um, the uh, very original uh, piano version, as Roger said, music which hasn't been heard more or less since the work was premiered, played on the piano by Carlo, and then in its realization on the Sibelius orchestral software system, which has been uh, painstakingly done by uh, Roger and Ian Schofield. Um, so that's the beginning of uh, the Proscrito journey. We are planning a full recording and concert of Il Proscrito uh, next summer. Um, more detail on that to follow. Um, but also to tell you that the Donizetti box set, uh, La Sedio di Cale, Diluvio Universale, and Ugo Conte de Parigi will be released on September the 29th. Um, the Zingari concert, as Carlo said, is on the 3rd of December at Cadogan Hall. Uh, booking is now open. Um, and we are delighted uh, to be working again with our friends and partners at the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and James Williams, their CEO, is uh, with us tonight. So we're thrilled to be working uh, with the RPO again. Um, as we draw to a close, I remember um, that the late, great Steve Jobs uh, of Apple fame always used to get to the end of one of his uh, great Apple product presentations, would leave the stage and would just turn around and say, oh, 
there's one more thing. And at this point, he would very famously introduce the very first version of the iPhone or the iPod. Um, well, there is just one more thing at Operara, um, and it is uh, something that we have been developing uh, over the last year, as all of us have had to deal with the challenges of not being able to bring live performances and to move our work more into the digital sphere. And this is what has um, uh, inspired us to create uh, My Operara. Um, which is basically a brand new exclusive donor portal um, where we have captured um, all of the myriad digital materials that we have put together since we started um, doing this work, uh, really with the recording of Les Martyrs in 2014. That was really the first time that we um, started making documentaries um, interviewing singers, uh, conductors, uh, musicologists, and trying to animate um, this fascinating journey of research and rediscovery uh, leading to concert uh, and recording. Um, so this is the first time that we have brought all of this material together in one place on our website. And here to give you just a very quick illustration is a very short video, video of what you of can what expect, you expect to, see to see in future. On May 20th, we're excited to launch our new online donor portal called My Opera Rara, with hours of documentary footage, never before seen interviews with our artists, access to our virtual event series, and unique behind the scenes explorations of Operara's process of restoring lost operatic gems, you can experience the forgotten masterpieces you've come to love in a new way. On May 20th, our annual fund supporters will receive their member login details. And from there, you're just a few clicks away from enjoying My Operara. All you need to do is enter your login details and you're there. This is just our way to say thank you for your support, which makes our work possible, and to bring you along for the journey as we continue rediscovering, restoring, recording, and performing the forgotten operatic heritage of the 19th and early 20th centuries. So, so there is there just is a, just a uh, uh, very short uh, illustration about what you can expect to see in the portal. We're still uh, building it and actually we're reminding ourselves of uh, material that we recorded. For example, I came across a fantastic talk which our uh, previous artistic director, Sir Mark Elder, gave on Semiramide um, in our old office in uh, studio in uh, Curtain Road. Um, and it's things like that which um, I hope you'll enjoy returning to, uh, customizing your own particular journey through Operara's work um, and stand by for your uh, login details on May 20th and uh, we hope you will enjoy the journey as much as we have. So um, for now um, I think we've got an opportunity for some questions. So anybody who'd like to ask a question you can either do so by unmuting yourself and going ahead or you can raise your hand or whichever you would prefer. So we are now open for questions. Any questions? <clears throat> no, we... Clearly we've, um, we've, um, blinded and inspired you with so much information that you need some time to uh, digest it all. Um, Charles, Charles Alexander has raised his hand. Ah, Charles Alexander uh, has raised his hand. Charles, please. I've got, I've got a question for, for Carlo and uh, uh, the team. Um, when we go through the kind of operas that we do, we have gone from, you announced, the, the repackaging of the originals. You've gone to a total and utter rediscovery in Mercadante and also Izingari. And you said that Izingari was in fact performed. My question is, how? why is Izingari 
a rare target for opera rara. Um, it reminds me perhaps of the reason we did Zaza, which was not rare in its time, but became rare because it fell out of fashion. So how does it fit into the mix of the vocation for our supporters? Well, I think uh, it's a very good question because uh, um, I don't think that uh, <clears throat> um, the only aim of the company is to uh, bring back from security operas that have never been heard before. But for example, Zingari, there are uh, two live performances, I think, that are recorded. But what we can do is actually to give uh, a real, um, not saying no, nor definitive or anything, but a real studio performance of, uh, of this opera. And uh, as I say, uh, is an opera in which personally I believe a lot, and not only me, also, you know, it's been done uh, around the world before. And I think uh, that uh, the important thing is that uh, with the um, clout also that Opera Rara has, uh, with the, um, um, uh, what is the word that I'm looking for, for from the tracks record, the track record of uh, of opera rara, I think that will be a very, very good thing. And in a way, something, I'm not saying a favor to the world of opera, but something that uh, could be uh, very important in uh, bringing back an opera that I think should be recognized. So it's not only rediscovering new opera, obscure operas, because for example, you know, there are three operas of Donizetti that has not yet been recorded, so and not been heard. But uh, uh, I don't know if it's uh, a useful thing to do for the modern public. Maybe from, for scholars, yes. But we are not just working for scholars. We are working for the public. The ambition is uh, that we present uh, some forgotten or neglected masterpieces that are good. So, and this, I, this is why I think really, uh, yeah. yeah, I think I it just is, sorry, another another way of, of, of saying that is that um I think what we what we can do is the the essential word here is rediscovery in a sense. What we can do is rediscover these operas. I think there's a way in which we can show Zingari in an entirely new light, just as in the same way a few years ago we rediscovered Semiramide. So it's a, it was a well enough known opera, but not in the way that, that we did it. So that word rediscovery is kind of important, I think. Um, I just saw that, uh, yeah, very good. No, absolutely. Uh, I just saw that uh, Andy Simmons has posted a message saying, I am discovering the operas of Alberto Franchetti and loving them. Well, that must be. Um, actually some telepathy, because I can show you on my computer about five tabs open about Alberto Franchetti. <laughs> because I think actually that there, in that period, uh, that is basically the Italian verismo, let's say the post Puccini, there are a lot of different strands that is not all only verismo. For example, you know, I just uh, uh, come back uh, um, last month from doing a new production of Francesca da Rimini of Zandonai, that although it's not a really rare opera, is uh, not very often performed. And I was uh, absolutely thrilled by the richness uh, and the diversity and the novelty of the musical language. And I'm not talking here as a sort of musical nerd. You know, I try always when I, when I, do my job, let's say, as artistic director, is to get uh, into the shoes of the public as somebody that may come uh, without even knowing uh, who Zandonai was or who Franchetti was. But uh, yes, going back to to <clears throat> sorry to Alberto Franchetti, uh, yes, I looked into some of the opera, and of course, uh, again, uh, uh, the question is: any plans to look into his work and something to be rediscovered? Yeah, possibly. I'm not saying yes or no. I reserve the right not to answer the question <laughs> for the moment. There is another uh, question um, about yeah, the I, I can I can see that one about Furioso, and it, it's it's a very good question because um, uh, Furioso, in fact. Uh, remains a project that we are very committed to uh, recording uh, this summer. Um, and this is still very much our aim to uh, record the piece. Um, 
and uh, we very much hope that we're going to be able to do that. Um, there are still one or two uh, challenges which we need to deal with, um, but we are, all of us at Operara are working flat out to do all we can to achieve uh, the Furioso recording. So watch this space and uh, we hope to make an announcement about it very soon. It's probably time for one more question, if... Uh... Uh, it's, Car it's Carlo Grosso, can you hear me? Hi, Carlo. Yes, we can hear hey. you. Great, great to hear you. you. Congratulations on a very exciting 2021 program. Is it premature or indiscreet to ask about projects beyond 21? <laughs> no, no, um, it's not premature or indiscreet. Uh, uh, it's just that uh, we are uh, we have not yet uh, finalized uh, uh, the project. Also, because particularly after this year, uh, one thing that is clear is that uh, we can make the best uh, uh, plans in the world, and uh, then we have to change it about fifty times. So at the moment, yes, we have of course uh, um, some uh, some uh, you know some titles in mind. And uh, so I will let now Harry answer so that he knows what he wants to say or what he doesn't want to say. <laughs> Thank you, Carlo. Um, yes, we, we do have a number of, of titles in mind. And in, in fact, um, the Prosquito project will be uh, in uh, the following financial year, the 22-23 uh, uh, period. Um, but there are a, a, a number of um, projects that we're, we're interested in. Um, one which I'll just allude to very briefly, uh, but it's very exciting, um, is a uh, complete recording of Donizetti's songs, which we've just literally just started to explore. There is a huge and very rich extensive body of work here, some 300 songs, and um, we're, we're really fascinated by the idea that Operara should be the organization to uh, bring this material uh, to light. Uh, in the 21st century. Um, so there, that gives you a, a taster of, of, of a project that's really uh, exciting us. But it's still at the very beginning of the journey. There's not a great deal more to say other than we're looking at ways that we can um, achieve that. Um, great. Well, um, I think we're pretty much at the end of our time. Um, before I uh, hand back to Charles to... Um, to draw things to a close. I just want to add um, uh, my thanks and the thanks of the whole Operara team for the many people here tonight who support our work because without you, um, none of these exciting and ambitious plans uh, would be possible. Charles, I know you're going to say a bit more about that, but um, uh, I want to, to, to just close by saying that from the team. It's been brilliant to have so many of you with us tonight and uh, over to Charles to bid farewell. Nothing more to add, Henry, than the fact that thank you all for attending uh, this event. I think we've uh, put out more, more video material than we usually do, um, as well as discussing the music. I particularly want to thank Della uh, Jones for being with us. Um, and for those of you who have not yet gone back to the early earlier recordings, only seems like only yesterday in which she starred so many of them, they will be available in, re, in a completely repackaged form later in the year, and they are simply stunning. Uh, Thank you. Um, the, so, in particular, we start this financial year in, in sound shape. You know who you are who have supported us. Thank you very much indeed. We really, really appreciate it because this company requires stability in order to do what it needs to do, which is to vindicate your support by the creation of great art. And that's what the team is doing. And so thanks to the team and thanks to everybody for joining us again and enjoy the rest of the evening and the rest of the spring. Great to see you all. Bye bye, bye for now. Thanks very much.